despite the fact they're coming off a loss in their second preseason game, 16 to 15 to the Tennessee Titans, there is mostly excitement and optimism surrounding the Seattle Seahawks this preseason as we head into the first season with Mike McDonald at the helm. Today on Seahawks Forever, powered by BetUS, we're going to take a look at some spots on the roster that are concerning. Well, the Seahawks may be in acquisition mode looking to fill some spots, including one key spot that my guest today thinks could include a big name as a possibility. Michael Thompson of 12th Man Rising, longtime friend of the show, is going to discuss the idea of potentially acquiring Hassan Reddick to add to the pass rush group on defense. And if you think, well, that's not possible, how could we acquire him? We can't give up enough to get him. We can't afford him. Michael's going to tell you why you're wrong. That's coming up next on Seahawks Forever. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast. In-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Viennes. Be sure to hit that thumbs up on the YouTube channel, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell for future notifications of future episodes. (laughs) Uh, Also, um, big shout out to the folks at BetUS. You can sign up for your account today and get a 125% sign up bonus on your first three deposits up to $2,000. That link is down in the description. Check out BetUS. And all the other ways you can support the show, as always, down in the description. Thank you to all of you who watch, listen, share, rate, review, comment, engage, and otherwise support the show. This is a big, big week for the Seahawks team in a number of ways as they get ready for their first and only home preseason game this Saturday at 7 p.m. Pacific time against the Cleveland Browns. Uh, Still yet to hear from Mike McDonald on how much, if at all, we will see the starters on Saturday. Interested in that. I will be attending the game. Um, would like to see some of the starters. Are we going to see Geno Smith? Uh, we won't see Connor Williams, but we did see him on the practice field yesterday. And that's one of the reasons that, that I say this week is so big. There were a couple of, I tweeted this out the other day. There's a couple of big questions this week that need to be answered in order for us to understand what's happening week one in a couple areas on the roster. One is Connor Williams. They have said since they acquired him, signing him two weeks ago, that he should be ready to go physically by week one, even though it's only nine months since he tore his his uh, ACL playing for the Miami Dolphins. But yesterday we saw him snapping the football, getting some blocking sled work. And it still amazes me. I was talking to Michael about this off air that it shouldn't amaze us because we saw it last year. We saw Jordan Brooks, tear his ACL on New Year's Eve, return to practice on August 15th and come out of the tunnel to start week one last year, 100% without a knee brace, playing some of his best football. And so, you know, maybe it's the idea that when he was first injured, his agent Drew Rosenhaus, you know, called it a significant injury. It wasn't just your typical clean ACL tear and maybe more to it than that maybe career threatening. And then he makes this miraculous recovery and he's able to go now. Again, he was out there without knee braces, looking great. So with the idea of essentially three weeks of practice now to get ready for week one, because remember there is there is that week in between now. They play the Browns this, this Saturday and then they get the week off. That he could be ready. And so that was one of the questions that needed to be answered this week. Would he be out there day one? And Coach McDonald said they have a plan to ramp him up and get him ready for week one. They're optimistic. Much less optimism around Abe Lucas. And that was the other question that needed to be answered this week. Going into training camp, there were reports we heard from Corbin Smith himself that he was told that Lucas should be ready to go week one. That would require him being ready to practice by about now. And throughout training camp, McDonald has been coy about it, said, you know, we can't give you a timeline, but we're optimistic. Yesterday, the tone changed for the first time and the most significantly since this began. And his his response was essentially, I better not ask that question, answer that question. I don't think I should answer that question. And then he didn't expand any further. That's not good. 
you know, when you think back to the very genesis of this with Lucas getting hurt early last year and Pete Carroll saying there was no surgical answer. There, there was no surgery needed that they did all the imaging and the testing and that he would just, he would heal on his own. And then he didn't. <laughs> and he tried to come back halfway through the season. We could see he wasn't the same player. They shut him down a few weeks later. And then at the beginning of the offseason, there was a surgical procedure. No details, no description. You know, you remember, uh, I was thinking back to when Jadevian Clowney was first injured. And I think actually when he was drafted by the Texans, there were concerns about his knee. And then they they addressed it specifically after his first year or two in the league with what was then called uh, microfracture surgery, which at the time was very revolutionary and experimental. It worked. Did Evan Clowney still in the league 10 years later, performing at a high level? We don't even know. We haven't even heard terms like that in regards to Abe Lucas. We don't know what the procedure was. We know that Pete Carroll used the word chronic at one point in the most detailed answer he ever gave. McDonald hasn't been that specific. But just reading the tea leaves and connecting the dots, it sure seems like this is something that is that cursed word, degenerative. And it sure start it's starting to feel less and less by the day like we're ever going to see Abe Lucas again, let alone at the level that we watched him at before. So we're going to talk about some ideas, maybe addressing that position, maybe defensive tackle, where again, um, sparked a debate in the last couple of days on Twitter at Seahawks Forever uh, about the availability of Cam Young who McDonald said at the beginning of training camp was two weeks away from returning. That was four weeks ago. The fourth round draft pick out of Mississippi State two years ago, going into his second year in the league, fits more of that traditional nose tackle mold of which really Jonathan Hankins, the 32-year-old vet, is the only guy on the roster that fits at the moment. Um, so we get into that with Michael and talk about some of those ideas. And then um, – He's the one that kind of convinced me to even have the Hassan Reddick conversation. He has some very detailed specifics on why he thinks it might work and how you could make it happen. So let's get into that conversation. This is Michael Thompson and I talking about potential acquisitions for the Seahawks on this episode of Seahawks Forever. So Michael, it's been a while since we've had you on the show. I think the last time we talked to draft, which is usually what we talk about on a pretty regular yeah. basis. Uh, but lately the focus has been on potential holes on this roster as good as the vibe is right now as good as everyone's feeling about this new staff and some of the personnel moves and how they've performed some of these young guys in the preseason there are some spots that would seem to be in need of reinforcements and let's stop before we get to kind of your big name idea the one we've been tossing around for the last couple of weeks let's talk about the most pressing news and that is the status of right tackle. Let's touch on this briefly because we were waiting, and I tweeted out the other day that three big questions this week regarding the Seahawks roster, and one of them certainly was the status of Abe Lucas. We have heard since the beginning of training camp, each update from McDonald become less and less positive and optimistic. And yesterday, coming off the second preseason game, his answer to the question was, I probably shouldn't answer that question right now. Not a good answer. <laughs> not a great answer, right? I mean, like, that's worrisome, right? I, I mean, at this point, do you even expect to see Abe Lucas not be on the pup list at the beginning of the year? It really sounds like that's where we're headed. It makes sense. I mean, we're talking about a potentially foundational piece that has a very serious issue on his knee in a position that your knees have to be like, you got to be locked in there or else your quarterback's going to be on his back five times a game because of you. And so we love Abe Lucas. You and I have loved him since the draft. We love his potential. That first year was fantastic. But we need to find out what he can be when he's healthy. And until he is healthy, there's it makes no sense to even rush him or pressure him in any of that stuff. That's kind of why you went out and got George Fant, um, which you know leads to, us to another problem that we have. But I think, I think you have to put him on the pump. I mean – you look at the schedule. We've talked about this. You and I talked about this before. The schedule is, is is there for the taking to win a couple games in the first half of the year. Three and three seems like kind of like the the minimum of where you should be if you kind of want to be a contender or a playoff team this year. 
And so I think that can be a, accomplished without Abe Lucas. You get through that first chunk of the season and then see where he's at. And even if he doesn't play this year, it, this is not, I don't think we're kidding ourselves. This is not a, probably a Super Bowl team necessarily, unless things really break right, which, which is possible. We've seen it before and, and other seasons, but if he's not healthy, you should be building for 2025. You should be building for 2026 when this, you know, new coaching staff and all these pieces really come together and it kind of crescendos into what should be a, you know, a three or four year plan. And if Abraham Lucas is part of that, that is when you need him and rushing him right now doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think we're seeing that again, whether it was Pete Carroll or now Mike McDonald, just a lot of vagueness, a lot of not very positive comments about him. And it sucks because I, I do think there's a franchise right tackle potential in there. Um, I think he clearly was the best offensive lineman in 2023 on a playoff team. Um, and now it's, it's almost like that might've been fool's gold, which I hate to say. And, and so that's why I want to see him get healthy. I want to see him get a real shot to get healthy. And I, I do, I'd be stunned to see him on opening day against Denver. Yeah, you touched on it. it. It's it's the mysterious nature of exactly what's going on that's so discouraging. Even going back, you know, to when the the injury first came to light, and Pete Carroll wouldn't name it, and he, he wouldn't get specific about it, and even used the word chronic at one point. Um, and then we went from you know a year ago at about this time, him saying that they did all the imaging, they did all the tests, there is no surgical answer for it. And then there was a, sur a surgical procedure performed in the offseason, uh, which, again, we don't have any clarity on. You know, this could be a degenerative thing. It could be, you know, bone on bone, uh, the, the type of thing that maybe an experimental type procedure. It's just it's uh, that's that's the part that that gives me pause before I think about being optimistic at all when it comes to Abe Lucas. And it, and it reminds me of what Michael Sean Dugar of The Athletic, a Seahawks beat reporter, said on this show that. Lucas being back raises the floor of the offensive line, but it also raises the ceiling. Whereas a healthy George Fant, and we really don't know how healthy he is because they've they've really treated him with kid gloves and bubble wrap throughout the preseason. But if he's able to go, he's he's a floor guy, right? He he may he may give you adequate performance at right tackle, but he's not going to raise your ceiling. What what would your thoughts be if George Fant had to be the long term solution? for 2024 at right tackle. You okay with that? I would be okay with that for the season. Um, I, I like, I think he did a fantastic job considering his limitations and his skill set. And like we were just talking about the ceiling and floor with Houston last year. Uh, I thought he did, you know, that's, that was a mobile, you know, Stroud kind of gets the moniker of not being a super mobile, but he, he is pretty mobile. And that is something that George Grant had experience with when Russ was in his prime and that's not necessarily what you're going to see a lot from Gino, but that's very difficult to block for a mobile quarterback and a rookie at that. And I thought he did a tremendous job helping get that team to a division championship uh, and also a playoff win and, and getting to the divisional round. And I think that's a very like accurate description of what Fant could be this year. Reliable, raises the floor to making you probably a wild card team considering your division. And yeah, maybe, you know, he holds the fort down enough for you to make enough plays to win a wild card game. But Abraham Lucas that we saw as a rookie in 2023, that looked like a guy that in 2025 and 2026, maybe even 2024 is a, is a, pro, is a pro bowl right tackle. That is the guy that's on a team that's playing for a conference championship. That's what I would say the difference is. It's about one or two game of a difference. And also just fans another year older and he doesn't have as much tread on the tires as your typical offensive tackle. Cause he was a, a swing guy for a long time and he earned the right to start on a playoff team last year. And I think he, if he's healthy has earned the right to get that spot this year. And he probably is a better player right now than Abraham Lucas. If, if our head coach isn't even wanting to answer a question about Abraham Lucas. Yeah. Unfortunately, and I guess really looking back now, the first real sign that, they weren't confident that Abe would be back for week one was when they moved um, McClendon Curtis from right guard where he'd been running with the, the first team all off season and moved him essentially permanently for now anyway, to right tackle to back up fan. How do you feel about his performance this preseason? And, and then with that, do you think that it, if, if they think that they're going to have to go without Abe Lucas for any length of time, maybe the season, maybe they just shut him down. At what point do they think about acquiring someone else for that spot? 
I don't think it's very fair to ask Curtis to do what he's been doing. And I think you see it on the field. And I think you kind of hit it on your on your post game, if I'm correct. Uh, he looked a little bit better in his second in the second game against Tennessee, but he, he physically can't play right tackle in the NFL. He's struggling against a somewhat thin defensive offense or defensive line that for the Tennessee Titans, a team that might be in contention for the number one pick. Like, you, what do you think he's going to do when he's playing against Nick Bosa? Like, you know, the the 49ers are smart. The Rams are smart. You know, these teams that we're going to play this year, they're going to see that this tape if he's our year start. And 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 I think it's a non-negotiable. I don't. I you cannot run into week one against Denver. And even though Denver and New England might not have the best pass rushers, those guys are coming. They're on our schedule. They're coming. Miami, Detroit, San Francisco. These guys will literally get Sam Howell and Geno Smith hurt if McClendon Curtis is your right tackle. He is a guard. That is what he's built and he's played. And to ask him to do this shows he's a good team player and it's helping us get through the preseason. But this strikes me as if, if Fant isn't ready, probably a day or two after preseason, uh, the third preseason game, you'll see us calling and seeing if we can make a deal with you know a fifth or sixth round pick for a guy that is probably angling to get a starting job or might be about to get pushed out of a starting job. And maybe we can borrow him and use him for the first six or seven weeks until whatever's going on with George Fant. And then obviously the Abe Lucas thing as well. But to ask Curtis to do that, that's you're, you're almost trying to play the season with one hand behind your back. Yeah. He's really seemed to struggle in pass protection. I, I knocked his footwork, uh, week one. Uh, it reminded me of a guy of, uh, a former first round draft pick uh, offensive tackle from the Seahawks. Um, that, uh, that I just don't want to mention his name right now. Um, and, uh, but I just want to be fair. In in the event that anyone watching this is is coming away f- from this concerned that the Clinton Curtis isn't he, he's a young player certainly a young player just recently moved back to tackle after playing it in college but being a guard primarily his first two years in the league but he also has done some good things the first couple of weeks and, and especially against the Titans was just moving dudes in the run game and and the combination of him and Bradford at right guard they were just absolutely blasting some of those second team Titans defensive linemen off the, off the line. And we saw that the result of that in Kenny McIntosh having a really dynamic first half. Um, and it, so not all hope is lost and there's things you can do with tight ends and other things. And in, that's why he, that, that's why he's had, a, he's had a role is as a guard is because you can see he's got that baller in him as a run blocker. He just physically is not does, built. Like he's just not built with his feet to to withstand in my opinion you know more than a couple games if not even a couple quarters as a right tackle as a guard i'm very still very interested in him. i still think he's a dude that should have a spot on this team it's just you're asking a lot if, if you're you're trying to to move the ball through the air with him as your right tackle for sure now let's go to the other side of the ball because that seems to be where there's some some concern as well and let's start up front because i've threw this idea out a couple of days ago and got a lot of really intelligent pushback from some people on Twitter that maybe I was overreacting, and that is at the nose tackle position. Jonathan Hankins was signed this offseason to do what he does best. That's clog up the middle and play the run primarily. He's been one of the most reliable nose tackles in the league, even as he's now on the other side of 30. But behind him, when you're looking for true nose tackles on this roster – the only other one is Cameron Young, who again, and I, I've reached out to some people this morning, haven't heard an answer back on on whether there's an update, but he's been out all of training camp. And what frustrates me about his situation is that at the very beginning of training camp, Mike McDonald said he was about two weeks away. Well, that was four weeks ago, and we still haven't seen Cameron Young. If he's not ready to go, now you're playing some guys out of position or you're having to cover schematically for the fact that you don't really have another nose tackle after Jonathan Hankins. Although we saw some really, really good things from Miles Adams, who just continues to keep himself in the conversation, you know, over these last couple of years. Yep. Uh, it, and am I overreacting if Cam Young's not healthy week one, you know, to, to essentially back up Jonathan Hankins? Can Mike McDonald kind of work around that and, and that maybe we don't necessarily need that 300 plus pounder to clog up the middle and what he does? I definitely think if anyone can scheme around it and make do, it would probably be Mike McDonald. I mean, everything he's shown us in these two years is he can work, work miracles with players that seem to be out of a job and all of a sudden he turns them into very rich Pro Bowl players and stuff. 
the nose tackle position is a very unique spot as well because that that is a spot that is used in Mike McDonald's scheme a lot. It's not used every time. And, you know, I think the defensive line is a definite strength of this team potentially with Murphy and Leonard um, and all these, these pieces that we have that we're really excited about. But it definitely does feel like it's on a little bit thinner of an ice in terms of depth. Than, than maybe I'm comfortable with. And I feel like if you gave me one more body and a guy that can rotate and play, you know, 33 to 40% of the snaps there and kind of rotate those guys and keep them fresh, I, make, I think that makes a big difference if you're trying to be a contender this year, if you're trying to make the playoffs and stuff. I, I, you know, Hankins is fine, but again, you know, you're talking about Cameron Young. Even if he is healthy, we still don't know a ton of what we got there with him. Sure. Stuff. Yeah. So um, I would definitely rather him be healthy and, we drafted him. Um, was that a fourth or fifth round pick last year and stuff? So like, I, I want to see what he's got. I'd rather have him have that shot there before we make a move. You know, going out in free agency, but we might not have a choice if he's not healthy. We might need to look at a band. Yeah, I think and one of the things that really illustrated the concern about that depth is I don't think it was ideal, and, and maybe it wasn't. You know, the the preferred course of action to have uh, Miles Adams, Mike Morris. Um, play the entire game against the Titans. You know, those guys are, are going to be in the rotation at some point. And Adams maybe now without Young uh, being available, being counted on more than ever. I, I don't think that was the plan. Now, one other possibility is that they had to release Matt Gotell last week, who would have fit that role, I think, to a T. It was an injury settlement. Doesn't sound like it was a severe injury. And there's already been some speculation that he could be re-signed to the practice squad again once he's healthy. Um, that's one possibility. Also, isn't isn't that position, especially when you're talking about older veterans, one that typically becomes available on the cut to 53? Those guys seem to be the guys that get cut when their roster crunches are available for veteran minimum dollars and just kind of move around to teams that are in need. Yeah, I feel like every year we get a, a version of a Snacks Harrison that is sitting out there after the final preseason game who might be around for a few weeks. I mean, Snacks is kind of a bigger name, literally and figuratively, but. Um, Overall, like you, you seem to hear of that kind of a guy that's just sitting up there, kind of waiting for the next playoff team, or someone's willing to give him an extra, you know, a few hundred grand more, or even a million more and stuff. And it's a position that actually kind of ages well because you're just kind of there to eat blocks and stuff. And, and if you can make any pressure, that's awesome. I mean, those guys, those are the ones that start to really get paid, as you see with like you know, Vita Vea and stuff. Which Vita Vea is not going to be on the market here in a couple of days and stuff. Yeah. So. But you can find a lot of guys that can do, you know, again, 30 to 40% of snaps, those early down snaps, and just trying to allow Leonard Williams and Byron Murphy to cook and allow your linebackers to get in there. Hopefully a healthy Dre Jones um, and Chen and Nuosu. Like, that's your four horsemen right there. Those are your guys that you really want. And, and Jerry, those are the guys you really want to see get that pressure and finding somebody, just somebody that can be healthy, play 35, 40% of the snaps and allow those guys to cook. That's all you need. And you can find those guys for a million bucks. Yeah, John Schneider has shown over the years, uh, you know, next to Pete Carroll's side that they, they sort of made an, an annual ritual or tradition out of that guys like Tony McDaniel, Al Woods, obviously that they would pick off of that pile. All right, you guys, if you just can't wait for the regular season, you want to get in on some live wagering, on these NFL games going into preseason week three, you can do that on BetUS. Just to look at their, their site here. Here you see the Seahawks games. Uh, plus, uh, the Seahawks are two and a half point favorites currently. Um, the over-under is set at 38 at the moment. How do you like that in week three preseason? Probably want to get a little more information on who's going to play and who's not, right? I'm going to go with uh, plus 120 right here for the Seahawks. I'm going to place a $100 bet. To win 120. If you sign up today with BetUS, they will give you a 125% sign up deposit on your first three deposits up to $2,000. That link that can direct you towards that sign up down below in the description. Check it out. Um, let's now go to your primary idea. And this is one that you pitched to me, I think, about a month ago, and I kind of dismissed it. But then we talked more specifics in the last few days and the cap ramifications of it. And I became more intrigued. The, the Seahawks have some really interesting young players that we like at the edge position. Obviously highlighted by Nuchen and who just signed his second big deal with, with Seattle. And then 
Boye Mafe, Derek Hall, who seems to to be in line for that Boye Mafe year two breakouts, having an outstanding preseason. But beyond that, that, that that's another position where we came into the season thinking it was going to be really di- deep and rich in talent. But Draymond Jones has been banged up. And, and the plan is he's going to play more at edge and outside linebacker this preseason. Hasn't been on the field. Daryl Taylor is really the fifth guy in that rotation. Sort of had to come back on a one-year, non-guaranteed, prove-it deal. Hasn't really shown me much in the preseason. Played the entire game against the Titans. Didn't really think he made an impact. And so you've you've been adamant that a big time one more big time edge guy on that defense might be enough to put put this team over the top and allow them to contend. And there's a guy out there right now who is available. Is there not? Yeah, there is a guy that is very very unhappy and is looking very more and more by the day realistic to get traded a second time this offseason. And that is all pro Pro Bowl uh, edge rusher outside linebacker Hassan Reddick. Uh, Hassan Reddick, uh, you guys probably remember him, had kind of a rough first couple of years in the NFL, was a top uh, 15 draft pick with the Arizona Cardinals. You look at his stats, they were asking him to play the linebacker. He's getting 60, 70 tackles a game, and then he ends up in Carolina for a year, has uh, 12 and a half sacks or 11 sacks, has a really good year. A Temple guy, so from Philadelphia area, ends up signing a three-year $45 million with the Philadelphia Eagles. In the last couple of years, he's been an absolute monster. Uh, the 2022 season, when the Philadelphia Eagles were, you know, a, potentially a, a, a questionable pass interference away from winning the Super Bowl, he was their best player on defense. Uh, finished fourth in defensive player of the year voting. Um, had 16 sacks that year. In the last four years, he's averaged 12 and a half sacks. He averages over two pressures a game. I mean, he still does play linebacker to an extent. He plays 74 percent of the snaps, so it's not like he's just you know, get in there on third down type of a guy. Yeah. Uh, and he wanted more money from Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is going through, um, you know, a very good lesson in the NFL, not for long. Uh, two years ago, they looked like the best team possibly ever assembled. And now you see sports uh, ESPN articles about Jalen Hurts and the coach going head to head and people leaving left and right. And maybe they still have a good season, but there's also a real chance that it falls apart. And he's one of those casualties about that. He wanted money. He wants more than $20 million. He wants to be closer to 30 than 20. And the Eagles just were not equipped to do that with all the, the science they had to do. So they shipped him to the Jets for uh, what I believe was a third round pick, which is if you get the Hassan Reddick you've had the last few years, that is insane value. It's very yeah. similar to what's going on with, with Judon in New England and Philadelphia, although it's a little different because New England is looking to rebuild. The Eagles and the Jets are not looking to rebuild. They're trying to win right now. And the expectation was, okay, he's going to the Meadowlands. He's going to sign a big deal there. And him and Rodgers and all of them are going to make a one- or two-year run. And there's been nothing going on. It's quiet. It's quiet. Quiet. And you're talking about a top five to seven, you know, third-down edge rusher in the NFL that's just sitting there without a deal. And I know you brought it up, but his contract, he's making his cap hit 750 grand this year. Yeah. Like, it's, there might there's not a better bargain in the NFL for your cap hit. Um, a pr- premier blue chip pass rusher and then all of a sudden you saw last week he wants out he wants to be traded and just a very weird situation going on where a guy that could probably turn the tide of a team being a playoff team to a potential championship team or could be the last over the top piece for a team you know is on the market and he wants to be traded again and the jets are saying no they don't want to trade him but i even have up here uh robert sala the other day was talked about it on a one of his local tv shows he talked about game planning without Hassan Reddick. Uh, it was Rich Samini uh, said, a guy like Hassan adds another closer to the mix. We already have four or five closers. So he'd be number number six when he arrived. Hmm. I take that as a little bit of, of a shot <laughs> to yeah. uh, a guy that if he stepped in tomorrow with the Jets, he's their number one edge rusher. And that's not that doesn't sound like a head coach that's really trying hard to get him to stay in the, with, with the Jets. And he has no loyalties there. He's never played us down. He's never practiced with them. Yeah. So th- I think this is getting ugly, uh, and there's a real chance he could be available. And I actually think, probably more than some other people do, that he could be a massive difference maker for the Seahawks this season. Now, you mentioned Matthew Judon is kind of a comp, but the difference is that Judon reported to Atlanta and said, hey, I haven't proven anything to this organization, so I'm going to go ahead and play under the last year of my deal and hope it works out. 
it's pretty evident now because we've seen Reddick go to a new team and not report that he's not going to, and things have been pretty quiet. He, he hasn't really spoken on the record much. It, it seems like he's going to want a new deal wherever he goes. That wouldn't seem to make sense here in the sense that the Seahawks are already paying two of their edges and Draymond Jones and Uchen and Wosu big money or big money. Could they make it work though? And, and I know, you know, I want to head this off because fans are going to think, hey, aren't we $25 million over the cap for 2025? We are. But could they make it work if they traded for him and gave him a new deal if that was in the cards? Or would someone, would they have to include someone like Draymond Jones in the deal, deal him elsewhere, make a move there? Or could you do both? I think you can do both. Uh, you know, we saw. You saw this with Jadavian Clowney to an extent, probably a very similar, um, and Reddick was a lot more uh, accomplished as a player than Clowney, but Clowney had much more, you know, pizzazz being the number one overall pick and all that stuff. Yeah, but they were able to work it. Yeah, they were able to work out a deal. Um, I can't remember exactly what they did, but they, uh, oh, they, they basically told him we're not going to tag you. If I recall is what they agreed upon was a big reason to get him to play that season without a contract which actually did backfire for Jadavian Clowney, by the way. Um, and it also, you know, Seattle had a few games that it helped out, but it wasn't the deal that we all thought it was going to be. But with, with Reddick, I think you can do that deal. The cap hit is so little this year. You can negotiate a deal that brings all the money in next year. And then as you've mentioned before, you can pull, there's about four or five levers that you can pull to make us one of the most cap friendly teams next season. Um, there are people that have contracts that are soon to be coming up and we've got players that will probably be asking for money shortly, but there's also a lot of guys that are probably not going to be on the Seahawks next year that are now um, due to age or whatever, or just contract negotiations and um, you know, all that funny money that the Rams have taught us over the years. You can do that. You can bring Hassan Reddick into this team. Yeah. Without ruining your future, in my opinion, and any deal for Son Reddick is probably actually very similar to what he signed with Philadelphia. It's probably a two or three year deal that all the money comes in 2025, and then he's probably you're probably able to move on from him in 2026 and 2027, as long as you know it benefits you and it benefits him. And at that point, he'll be 32, um, 33 at that point. But it's also important to remember he's only played, he's only started 80 games in his career, so he's actually got pretty pretty light on his on his on his wheels instead and his tread and stuff. So there's a chance you could sign him for a three-year deal and you do get a great player for all three seasons. But next year and this year are probably the last two years of his run. Here's what intrigues me about the possibility is when you think about Daryl Taylor's deal that he, that he yeah. signed the one, the one year deal they had originally tendered him. It's, it's almost completely non-guaranteed a couple hundred thousand guaranteed. You could cut him today and save about $3.1 million against the current cap, which even after, according to over the cap, even they have included Connor Williams deal now in the calculations. If you cut Daryl Taylor today, you'd be at about $11.5 million in cap space, believe it or not, with the, some of the moves they've made. Now, notwithstanding 2025, because it's just going to, um, you know, that's looming. It's completely doable. I, I mean, if you wanted to, if you thought this team, to your point, had a chance to contend and needed that one more dynamic edge player, you could essentially swap Daryl Taylor for Hassan Reddick and do it money-wise and make it work. And then, yeah, you're going to face a crunch next year. But there's a couple of things that, that we don't know. The Seahawks have a different cap guy now than they've had for the last 10 years. Matt Thomas moved on. It's Joey Lane now. He has shown more of a willingness to do some creative things, such as use void years. And if if you're out there also asking, how in the heck is it possible that Hassan Reddick only has a $750 cap charge this year on a three-year, $45 million contract? It's because he had three void years tacked onto the end of it to spread out that cap hit. So you can make this work. And that's why I <laughs> realized I was way too easily dismissive of it to begin with and then figure out the cap stuff next year because essentially wouldn't you then be looking at 2025 as, well, I was going to say deciding between Hassan Reddick and Draymond Jones or Hassan Reddick, Draymond Jones, and Uchenna Nwosu. But you'd be basically putting Draymond Jones on notice that you better perform. And if you do perform up to a level, we're probably good. Yeah. Right. 
Exactly. Yeah. I mean, because pr- pressure, pressure makes diamonds, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it reveals character, reveals who you are. And we're paying a guy a lot of money that did not even come close to half the value of his contract in Draymond Jones. And I like Draymond Jones. I think there's a lot of potential there. But you ask any Seahawks fan, any NFL fan, who would you rather have, Draymond Jones or Hassan Reddick? They're, they're going to take Hassan Reddick. Yeah. And, but again, maybe you can have all three of those guys because right. Jones deal spikes next year. His cap charge next year is about $26 million, but then in the final year of his deal it drops to four and a half. So if he, if he gets healthy and plays well this year and you have that four headed monster, basically with Nuosu, Reddick and Jones playing mostly edge and Mafe and even Daryl Taylor, I mean, uh, uh, Derek Hall in there. That gives you what you need, I think, I agree with you, to compete against the offenses in this division and wreak havoc on those on Sean McVay and Kyle Shanahan and whatever's happening down there in Arizona. And then it gives you the chance to then reset in the offseason. And if Draymond Jones goes out and plays great and that rotation works, you can redo his deal. He's young enough next year and you can lower that cap it significantly. If not, you can trade him or cut him next year and save about half of that cap charge. Um, there'd be dead money, obviously. but uh, so. I'm, I'm on board. I it, it's probably unrealistic. I, I mean, at some point, don't don't you figure the Jets probably figure something out? I mean, they did give up a lot to get him, and I don't know. It it just seems like that would be an an I I an indictment I like using them. the word embarrassing. You know, when it comes to yeah. pro sports, the way some fans toss it around, but it wouldn't shed it wouldn't shed the best light on that organization and their decision making. No, it wouldn't. And, and and if there are a handful of the team teams in the NFL that will embarrass themselves or do something ridiculous, are the Jets one of them? Sometimes they they kind of are um, one of those teams. I mean, they've got a fantastic defense. Uh, we've known Sala for a long time. If Rodgers is healthy, that team's a potential contender. That's a team you don't want to face. Um, it, it, I know they've they've got other plans. They're trying to go get Devontae Adams or whatever else they're trying to go out there and do. They're all in this year. I mean, this might be Aaron Rodgers last year. He might play next year. I mean, it's a short window and stuff, and so I don't think they want to mess around. And, yes, the logical thing is they will end up getting a deal figured out. That's probably a little bit, you know, here's a little bone to help you get through this year. We're going to pay you good money next year, and then after that, your career is maybe towards its end, and so is this run with with the Jets and stuff. But to your point, I mean, does a fourth-round pick in Daryl Taylor the project, the talented pass rusher, right. did that entice the Jets to be like, yeah, you know, we save a little bit of face. Hey, he didn't want to be here. He wasn't one of us type of a thing. But we got Daryl Taylor, who's a poor man, Sasan Reddick, a very, 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 very poor man, Sasan Reddick, um, and a fourth round pick. So we lost a third round pick, picked up a fourth from a team in Seattle that we think we're better than. You know, I mean, obviously it could be the comp fourth round pick as well, but. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a deal that sense. makes it work. It makes a lot yeah. of sense. Then, yeah, because you you mentioned the comp pick, so the Seahawks have an extra fourth rounder to look forward to next year. Makes sense for the Jets because they still get a player that that could be useful in their pass rush, and and but yet you know if he's not a fit, there's no guaranteed money. It's an, they can move on from him easily, and you know makes sense in in you mentioned the Matt Judon trade as a comp, but you're not likely to get a third in return now for Reddick because teams know he's not going to report and play unless you give him the new deal. There was obviously the, the, I'm, I'm guessing without even knowing the ins and outs of it, that, that the Atlanta Falcons felt pretty comfortable that Judon was going to report that everything was going to be fine. Talk to the agent and all of that. Um, and felt comfortable giving up the third because of that, um, where that isn't the case. I don't think with Reddick. Yeah, and it also Atlanta is a team that at the moment looks like it's on the upswing. Yeah. I mean, they're going for it with Kirk Cousins. You know, the Penix thing's kind of weird, but uh, that's a division that's weak. Um, that's yeah. a fun place to be. That's a fun place to play. Uh, and and then you got an owner that wants to win. Um, and so that does make sense. It does make sense. That's a very different environment than, than New England is right now. Whereas with the Jets, it is a little bit awkward because they want to win. And like you said, they're trying to save face. And so. I think you have to be willing to give up enough before they're willing to be like, all right, fine. And before they start to bury some dirt on him on Reddick and stuff and try and distance themselves. But at the end of the day, I do think they'll go out and they'll try and get a deal done with them. But if not, I think that's one of the more fair offers you're going to get. You're not going to get a third round pick again. 
no, yeah. no one's going to stick their neck out there the way that the Jets did, and they they've been embarrassed by this. There's no doubt about it. So, um, so on the subject of uh, potential acquisitions or roster weaknesses that need to be addressed, before I let you go, how are you feeling about the inside linebacker situation? If Jerome Baker isn't on the field soon and isn't going to be there for week one, and you're having to rely on Terrell Dodson, Tyrese Knight, the fourth round rookie, and then John Radigan, Patrick O'Connell after that. Are you comfortable with Mike McDonald making that work until Baker comes back? Or are you wanting them to also be scouring that waiver wire or even trying to make a deal for a team that might have an inside linebacker to spare? So I think like in all realistic as a franchise, they're, they're scouring, they're looking, they're, they're looking for anybody that could come in and, and fit those pieces. Um, I think I did see yesterday that Jerome Baker did do some activities yesterday. Um, I don't know if it was on his own or, or with a smart group. It wasn't anything super intense, but a slow process. And if you talk to any Miami Dolphins fan of the years, ultimate potential, all the talent in the world just can't stay healthy. Can't even can't even stay healthy for, for a full game without going out on the sidelines or something like that. So, again, that's just another one of those scary things, kind of like Abe Lucas, where – yeah, you can hope for the best, but you should probably be preparing for the worst. Um, and, and the worst would be assuming that Jerome Baker is not going to be on this team for the first few weeks of the season while he gets healthy. And if he has that, uh, you know, unluckiness to him, then you need to have someone always ready potentially just in case. Dotson is very talented. Uh, Tyrese Knight is very raw, is very fresh as a rookie. Um, we do know from what we've heard is that that's a guy that Mike McDonald, you know, banged on the table for, and that was one of his, that's my guy. And you ask anybody in the NFL, what does Mike McDonald specialize in? He specializes in the linebacker. So that's his forte. Yeah. That's what he knows. He, he can, he can make magic over there. And so I like Knight. I would rather Knight steal this, the spot so I don't have to pay a linebacker and I can have these rookies do their thing. Um, I thought that Radigan has shown out pretty well so far. But again, it's just, it leaves you wanting one more stable person. And if Baker isn't healthy, then yeah, I would think you have to be looking for, for bodies and stuff. But you, you drafted Knight and everything you're hearing is that it sounds like Knight's going to be a guy this year. And he's shown that so far in the preseason. But to ask Knight and Dotson to be your duo with, with uh, Radigan and, and, and Connell, uh, that's a lot to ask without Baker being there. I think you're, again, just like we talked about the defensive line, I feel like you're a body short. Yeah, I feel like if that ends up being the case, we're going to see a lot of three safety looks and, and, a, and a lot of kind of big nickel type alignments, uh, especially against the Rams or 49ers, rather than going within your traditional two inside linebackers. Because, uh, yeah, it's tough to ask. And it, it doesn't help that, uh, you know, we're already seeing all the love and accolades in the way that Jordan Brooks has looked in Miami yeah. in this preseason and how much they're raving about his performance down there, what they're seeing from him on the field. So, uh, yeah, they're not going to, they're not going to be able to shake that one until Jerome Baker, uh, you know, gets on the field. And yeah. produces. And the physical part, that's not a concern I have about Knight or, or Dotson. It's just having that experience, just, you know, even Dotson as fantastic as he's looked as, as loved as he was by PFF, his snap count was very, very low. I mean, this is still a very, very young player that needs to prove himself. And you, like you said, it's not, you know, you're going to see the Niners twice. You're going to see the Dolphins with McDaniel. You're going to see uh, the Rams. Like you're going to see five to seven games with that, that Shanahan scheme, that McVay scheme. And they just know how to tear your linebackers apart. And that, that makes me very, very concerned about our ability to contend. Cause those are the, the two teams you got to, you got to be able to find a way to split those four games with if you want to make the playoffs this year. And if they they have an advantage with Dotson and, and Knight just because of their experience, Shanahan will find it. They will find it. They're going to find it. And so that's where it would be nice to get Baker back on the field, a guy that was with Miami and kind of knows what to look for because he saw it in practice all year last year and stuff. But um, from a talent-wise, it's there. It'd just be nice to get another veteran that has some experience and how to handle those sweeps and those corners and all the misdirection. Yeah. It's going to be a fun cut down date. I, I do. I'm, I still have mixed feelings. I, I still kind of prefer the old way. It'd be nice to have an initial cut down date so that maybe you can be looking for those reinforcements now, but you know, is what it is. It just makes for basically one big additional wave of free agency here in about two weeks where teams can go shopping and, and try to fit some needs. Uh, good to have you back on the show. We'll have hey. to 
Appreciate we'll have to it. Do it again uh, as we get into the college football season, start looking ahead to next year's draft and talk about some positions of need, uh, which we may have done today because right tackle could certainly be one of those as we head into next year's draft based on what we're seeing now. So Michael Thompson, 12th man rising. Always good to have you on the show, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, buddy. Always great to have Michael on the show. Be sure to read his stuff at 12th Man Rising, my old stomping grounds back in the day when Keith Myers and I were co-editors of that website. Michael does some really good work. And um, as I said, we'll get him back on the show when it's time to talk draft, which is always, but especially once we're a couple of weeks into the into the college football season. Hey, big announcement here for the channel and the show. Um Seahawks Forever will be joining the Blue Wire Podcast Network. It is a uh, one of the biggest sports podcast networks out there. Uh, features such big names as Cam Newton and former NFL player Chris Long uh, on their site. Uh, also a friend of the show and Seahawks beat reporter Michael Sean Dugar uh, and his man-to-man podcast is on the Blue Wire Network as well. Really excited to work with those guys and uh, them inviting me to join their network is thanks to you for all of the support that you have shown the channel um, in the year and a half since it has launched under this banner of Seahawks forever. If you want to continue to support the show, all those ways are down in the description. Also just share it, hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up, hit the bell. So you get notification of future episodes. The next episode will be the long promised 53 man roster prediction. Um, some things have changed in my eyes uh, based on some performances uh, against Tennessee and also some of the things coaches are saying about certain players after that, trying to read between the lines and get an idea how much these coaches like some of these players. So uh, I will be giving that prediction in a couple of days. So make sure you subscribe so you do not miss that. And as always, follow me on Twitter at Seahawks Forever. Thanks again to the folks at BetUS for uh, sponsoring this episode. I'm Dan. Um, Forever and always go Hawks. And uh, thank you again so much for the support and for watching this program. See ya.